I grew up in a whole family of scientists and engineers. My dad was a nuclear engineering professor at the University of Michigan. And he actually uh, periodically did consultation for NASA uh, designing uh, radiation uh, detectors oh, wow. for uh, different space probes. Uh, he had those kinds of connections. And, um, and I came close to, to going into a serious uh, science or, or engineering field. But this was also a household that valued art. Mm -hmm. And I loved art and I loved motion pictures. And ultimately, you know, that, that won out and, and I ended up going into to film. But uh, working in visual effects is one of the closest things there is to cinema engineering. Mm -hmm. There is because there's a very strong technological component to what we do. And a big part of the appeal for me is applying uh, technology and engineering problem solving to art. And that fusion of the two, I find really very satisfying. So I encountered that a little bit, I guess, uh, coming into an engineering world from a different world. I, I went to the Air Force Academy, but ultimately went into medicine, trained in emergency medicine and then aerospace medicine. But coming into NASA um, with a a medical background, I mean, it's, it's a little jarring to um, go from a world of biology, where there, of course, within medicine is a, is a lot of engineering, but into just very much a, a, an engineering world and trying to see those two things mix um, to understand how the human is supported and um, is a part of kind of the overall system um, is, is very inter interesting. Um, but trying to navigate that as a physician and then ultimately, once I joined the astronaut office, um, to continue to advocate for the human in the system. Um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes, you know, we think about all of the, the rockets and the control systems and, and guidance, um, but remembering that there is a human um, in the middle of all of that that we're, we're trying to take care of. So you reference being inspired by th those engineering images of Apollo and Gemini and, and uh, and for myself, when I am talking with groups about, I guess, kind of my origin story, I, I know that within the first few sentences, like I will talk about Star Wars. And so I've wanted to be an astronaut for as long as I can remember. And it's because of reading and watching science fiction. And I know the book um, that inspired me. And then the movies were, I was four when uh, A New Hope came out. and. Um, and so that dream of living and working in space has, has been something that um, I think really kind of pulled me along this path. But it wasn't until watching the space shuttle launch in 81 uh, in second grade that it really rang um, true for me that there actually was an opportunity to do what I had been um, seeing in Star Wars. Um, well, so we have an opportunity to carry a small allotment of uh, items with us. Um, as we fly. These long duration missions, you know, oftentimes will bring uh, photos of our families, photos for friends, um, and then some small things that are meaningful uh, to us. So I flew uh, during my last mission. Um, these are my ob objects of inspiration from, uh, from when I was little. So we've got my uh, little R2, little Luke Skywalker and then Darth Vader, all the original Star Wars figures. They've got uh, little coins of Velcro on the back so that I don't lose them. Everything tends to float away. And then this is actually this, the uh, Luke Skywalker that I broke, I broke the head off of it and my dad uh, took like a little bolt and, and uh, was able to drill out and put it back on there for me. But uh, these are just, uh, for me, just kind of sources of uh, inspiration, what, what inspired me to to pursue uh, space flight, and so kind of a, a cool full circle Pretty good. item. R2-D2 has actually <laughs> been to space. And so uh, this cycle of, um, of science fiction inspiring uh, you know, generations of uh, leaders and scientists and explorers um, to pursue the field and then to do the things that we've seen in the movies uh, to come full circle like that, I think is it's really, it's a really cool thing, and so, I mean, I thank you for, for providing, um, really the the framework for a lot of those a lot of those dreams. Yeah, well, thank you for saying that. Uh, I, 
I, I feel like the uh, inspiration is bi-directional. That uh, I've certainly heard stories of um, uh, folks that were inspired by things that they saw in science fiction to mm -hmm. try and bring some version of that to the real right. world. And in those ways, science fiction being kind of um, no barriers, uh, free thinking about what the future could be, um, sort of inspires engineers to figure out, well, how could we make something like that, that yep. happen? And then vice versa. I mean, I, I, I always try to look to real world uh, imagery for inspiration for what we're doing. Dennis Murin is uh, famous for his don't, don't copy other movies, uh, go to primary references if you can. And, and what he means by that is, you know, if you're doing uh, a, a movie with dinosaurs and you're the first one, you're doing Jurassic Park, you don't necessarily look to uh, what other movies have done for dinosaurs uh, and sort of copy the best parts you see of mm -hmm. that. You look to, well, what are the, the closest analogs in the real world to it? Like uh, for the Gallimimuses, well, we'll look at ostriches. And for the Brontosaurus, um, we'll, we'll look at the elephants. Sure. And you know, study motion and, and animal behavior from, from that. Um, when we're working on science fiction, I'm often looking at, at uh, you know, real imagery of, uh, of the Earth from orbit. Or um, you know, we're depicting a gas giant. I'll look at the latest Juno probe images, Absolutely. which are Bonkers, right. those are amazing. I'm a huge fan of the original trilogy, but Rogue One has snuck its way into the rankings. I talk about the top four now because I can't, uh, just from a nostalgia standpoint, it's hard for me to, to rank something above that original trilogy, but just absolutely love the story of the characters. So one of my favorite scenes in there is um, the Hammerhead Corvette. Light, oh, yeah. the light maker. It was that. It, yeah, that was is what you're, the story that you came up with. D did most of that translate to the screen? Um, I was looking for a way to uh, to destroy a couple of, of big M imperial assets, um, but not in the cliched ways we've seen a thousand times. And I got thinking about how big a star destroyer is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a mile long. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, and if you've ever seen any of the footage of a of a cruise ship or something that has has misjudged its uh, speed and right. then just plowed wow. into a, a dock, that you know that much tonnage, even when it's only moving at three miles an hour, yeah. just all that kinetic energy uh, can do a lot of damage. Uh, I'd like the idea of. Um, if we zapped a couple of star destroyers so they were essentially inert objects and then uh, then pushed one into the other just that much mass it would be slow motion destruction it would all be about kinetic energy sure. and that that uh, that all the tearing and shredding would be something we hadn't really seen before that was amazing visually and but the human story there of like that the of lightmakers crew just like stepping up and like okay this is what we're going to do yeah, you know, um, in, in my head canon, they've, they've all survived. We choose to believe that too. Yeah, that there so, are. so what we did is the ship has got lifeboats on it. Uh -huh. And it's really hard to see. But uh, there's a, a shot where the Star Destroyer is actually crashing into the dock. Right. And you can see that hammerhead Corvette there. And the lifeboats are all gone. Perfect. That's so what we wanted to hear. They got away. That's awesome. One of the things I wanted to, to ask you is, in the entertainment industry, we frequently do a lot of unrealistic stylizations. You know, the, the, the one everybody always mentions is sound in space. But even just being able to see stars in the same exposure as right. sunlight, uh, ships coming together and everybody agreeing on which direction is, is up, all those kinds of sort of silly things that are done so often that people don't even think about them and are very used to them. Does that drive you crazy? So there's certainly there are movies that are trying to be hyper-realistic and, and I think it's in those movies when people are ignoring physics and, yeah. uh, and trying to be realistic in some ways and then just, just letting other things go. That, I think that can be a little frustrating. 
Um, especially when those things are done uh, in the name of creating drama, where I think in that realistic environment, there is already, I mean, we are living in a hazardous environment and the void, yeah. the vacuum of space. And so there is already enough built-in drama that I, I don't think that you really have to create it. Um, I think though, in the more science fiction environment, I think there's an expectation and understanding that, um, that bringing in the sound and the light and, and um, making everybody upright, that that, you know, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's easy to give a pass to that because um, I think sometimes some of those elements are even disruptive. Uh, it's really interesting they talk about the upright because I think that's a question that we get a lot is, hey, you know, I understand that there's no up in space. And the truth of it is, is there, act there actually is for us. We can certainly make up any direction that we want if we're doing work that's close to the deck. We just flip upside down and, and that is now our local up. But uh, on the space station, for example, all the labels, all of the switches, everything oh, is in a, in a given orientation. Um, and so that drives, drives up um, our training facility, our mock-up back on Earth at Johnson Space Center. We get very used to moving around in that environment. And so because there is a, a, an up and down there, we bring that with us um, mm -hmm. to the space station. And then finally, lights. Lights are an incredible orientation giver. And so you, anywhere you're at, you kind of want the lights overhead. In fact, one of our modules, which was um, originally a, a logistics module for the shuttle that became a, a stowage module for the space station, is clocked in a way where the lights are on the floor. And during my first mission, it took me uh, a couple of months to figure out why it, was, it felt so weird in that module. And it, I discovered it's because the lights were <laughs> oh, on the floor. So, yeah. yeah. So when we flew on the Soyuz um, rocket, they have an object that you bring with called the Nevisomosti indicator, which is the um, zero G indicator, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so it's typically a little stuffed animal um, of some sort suspended on a lanyard so that when you're launching, you have one G, it's hanging down. But as soon as your, your, the secondary engine cuts off, um, mm -hmm it will begin to float. And it's just a visual indicator for both the crew and then the people that are watching um, by camera that, that we've made it safely into low Earth orbit. And so I talked with my kids. Generally, it's the crew's kids that get to kind of determine, hey, what is that little stuffed animal uh -huh. gonna be? And so for us, um, we chose a little R2-D2 because every spacecraft needs a, an astromech. And so that was a really fun, a little, a really fun thing to bring with us. And, Very cool. Yeah, grateful for the, the kids' insight and inspiration to do that. When uh, we first arrived at the space station, our capsule actually docked to the Zenith. And, uh, and in training, we would always, there, we have two ports, one forward and one Zenith, and we always pretend like we're coming through the forward port and everybody is upright. Um, coming from the Zenith, coming down from the overhead into the space station, um, I never got used to that. Every time I would go up into our capsule, you assume an orientation there, transition through the little passage, and then it was, I was always trying to figure out, okay, which, which direction do I need to go? So I think our, brain, our brains just aren't used to that kind of, uh, even that, or that type of geography, and it takes a little while to, oh, yeah. to figure that out. We've lived our whole lives in this essentially 2D planar Absolutely. kind of space. Yeah. And as for sound, I mean, I, I just think of a TIE fighter going by without the TIE fighter screech and just how disappointing that would be. So, yeah. uh, so. It, certainly the sound adds a lot of drama. Um, you know, it's, it has occurred to me that, uh, you know, well, what is sound? Sound is a uh, uh, traveling pressure gradient in a, in a medium, right? And uh, um, well, if you're in a vacuum, in theory, there's no sound, but would you hear an explosion? I would, I would argue that if you had a microphone out in space, and there was a nearby explosion, it would pick up the expanding gas envelope from the explosion, wouldn't it? I don't, I don't know about that. I, uh, it's interesting. I think we would definitely hear the little tinkling of parts of yeah. whatever it exploded kind of impacting the space station. Um, when we're doing our spacewalks, we certainly can't hear what's going on around us, but mm -hmm. if we're connected to I mean, our suits, when we're holding onto the space station, we've got a path for those sound waves to travel. Yeah, and yeah. so you can hear sound in that matter. In fact, one of the things that we practice, if our radios break while we're doing a spacewalk, we would actually come close to each other and put like face shield to face shield to be able to talk oh, with each other as, a, as kind of a last That's resort cool. ability to communicate. Um, 
But as far as sound goes, it's really interesting because there's always, you know, we think about space as not having sound, but within the space station, within our spacesuits, there's always sound. There's always an a low ambient uh, sound of the fans, of the pumps. Mm -hmm. The space station almost feels alive in that way um, because there's, whenever you have people on the spacecraft, we have to have some way of moving uh, ventilation around. If there's yeah. no, there's no uh, gravity driven convection and so hot air doesn't rise. And so you would end up just building a carbon dioxide bubble around your face. Oh, yeah. And we need something that's constantly kind of mixing the air. And so that means that there's just, there's always, um, there's always a pump running. Uh, there's always a, a fan blowing. One thing that I remember reading about from um, Skylab was that because it was a, a low pressure, but 100% oxygen atmosphere, the low pressure meant that sound did not transmit as well across the volume. And even being 15 feet away from right. someone, your voice did not carry like they, you expect, right, right. that it would be much quieter. You had to get closer to somebody or speak louder. Um, what's, the, what's the air pressure on the ISS, is it? So I think for Skylab, um, they were down to five PSI. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, maybe not 100%, but very close to 100% oxygen. Um, but talking, I actually had the opportunity to talk with some of those astronauts, and, and you had to yell to be able to make yourself heard. Um, on station, we actually fly at 14.7, so a sea level um, atmosphere with a, a kind of the standard 21% oxygen and mm -hmm. mostly, mostly other nitrogen. Um, and so sound travels fairly normally. Um, the, ge the geometry of the station, uh, the materials used in the walls all kind of um, control a little bit how, how, sound, how sound travels there. But we decided to go with that pressure kind of based on, hey, we're trying to do experiments on the space station. We want those to correlate somewhat to what we're doing on the Earth so we, have, we can have good controls. And so mm -hmm. kind of to decide, decided to go with that atmospheric pressure um, also as a mitigation against fire. Anytime the percentages get much higher than yeah. 30, 35%, now we've got a flammability risk that we've got to deal with. The downside is that in preparation for spacewalks, it means that we have to pre-breathe because of at the pressure that we operate our spacesuits at. We have, to, we have a long preparation pre-breathe period to, to get rid of the nitrogen in our systems before we go out to do a spacewalk. Mm -hmm. and, and that has some implica implications for our future exploration as we go to the moon. What do we want to have our gateway, this kind of the lunar space station pressure at, the exploration vehicles on the ground? What pressures do we want to run there? Because we'd like our astronauts to be able to get out of the vehicle and, and, and get out and exploring much more quickly than we're able to do on the space station right now. These are things that, I, that aren't always necessarily taken into account in movies because it's not particularly exciting to see people just like hanging out in their spacesuits for three hours waiting before they can go out to do a spacewalk. Well, John, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you, John. I really appreciate this opportunity.